The UK is hot in the middle of the hunt for the next prime minister. And joining us now to break down the likely candidates and the likeliest candidate is one of my favorite people in the entire world, Shivala Madlina, investigative journalist and filmmaker. Shivala, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me again. It has certainly been a while, and I make this promise to you every time there's a leadership crisis in the UK, we will turn to you <laughs> to understand what's going on. Please okay, so, don't. <laughs> so, just to make clear, you, you are you are UK based, although you do a lot of investigative journalism and filmmaking work outside of the UK. Where are you actually right now? I'm in London. I'm trapped okay, on the island now. watching this like festival of idiocy, but yeah. <laughs> There are much more knowledgeable erudite people on this topic than I, but I have been held hostage to like the unfolding madness. So, and none that I know personally. So we turn now to you. So <laughs> what's going on in the UK? What what is the process? Where are we at in the process right now? Okay, so um, the way that the different parties in the UK have different um, types of contests for their leadership, um, Labour's is a little bit more complicated. They have um, some sort of kind of representative portion of the vote, which goes to trade unions and things like that. But with the Tory party, it is card carrying members have the vote and it is um, like a first past the post uh, leadership contest. And it officially began on the 22nd. At which point you had the two front runners, Hunt and, and Boris Johnson, or Alexander Boris de Feffel Johnson, if we want to use his full name. <laughs> um, and uh, so you've got basically a month of city to city hustings, they're called, and it's basically kind of mini leadership. It's a little bit like um, the primaries. Um, and it's, yeah, city to city uh, leadership contests, mini contests, and they're hitting the campaign trail, both of them. Hunt, Jeremy Hunt, former culture secretary and health secretary, uh, sorry, minister, and um, Boris. So on the 22nd is when the results should be known, although, you know, Johnson's obviously the clear front runner. He's like 20% ahead in, in the most recent polling. Um, and yeah, by the 23rd, then we will have the official kind of choice to replace Theresa May. And so just just fast, so in the, the initial votes that were held, Boris Johnson won all of those votes. It now goes to these hustings, as you point out. And it's expected that Boris Johnson actually has more support out there than he did in the initial votes that he already won, right? Yeah, I mean, there's Boris has always had a party that's been deeply skeptical of him from the beginning. He's he's weirdly an insider outsider, mm -hmm. um, which he clearly likes and wants to kind of preserve until the very last second because that obviously helps him in not just the leadership contest, but then any sort of ensuing election after that, which is a real possibility. Um, we'll get into game gaming out what's going to happen if and when he he takes leadership. Um, but yeah, he he he's. That's, I think, also the theory as to why his handlers have been um, reticent to let him out in the public as much, because he is Teflon Boris. I, you know, we've heard that before, um, where he kind of he makes these affable gaffes and nothing really sticks. He can say things that are racist or inaccurate, or go and have an agreement with his prime minister. Um, like he did at checkers and then come out completely mm -hmm. stabber in the back and um, tell everybody he doesn't actually know what a customs agreement is. Uh, <laughs> but nothing seems to really stick. So, but at the same time, I think that that's kind of a quality they don't want to press too hard, um, especially with the base. Yeah, and so for people in the US who aren't as familiar, um, I was doing some reading up on things that he said, and I, it, it's a slur that I'm not going to repeat, but he referred to Africans as a racial slur. He said just last year that women in burqas look like bank robbers in an op-ed that he wrote and then chose to publish, um, just to give you an idea of who he is. And so it, it looks like at this point he is likely to win. So we can talk about Jeremy Hunt if there's time at the end, but um, what does it mean if he does take over both for uh, Brexit, where I think he's, if I'm, if I'm right, he's saying he's going to force the EU back to the negotiating table. I think Jeremy Hunt has said that as well. Uh, the EU says that's not going to happen regardless of who wins, <laughs> and the same timetable uh, remains from before Theresa May stepped down. So if he does win as he's expected to, what's going to happen? Right, so it was, it was Prime Minister's question time today, and Theresa May was kind of rapidly defending both Hunt and and Johnson, and kind of defending their records. But just to kind of just to finish off and polish off your references to Boris's past record and his other positions, um, when he was Foreign Minister, as well, he made he's made he made some really inaccurate and 
unfortunate remarks about a an Iranian British woman who is still in jail. And because of his remarks, the Iranians use this as propaganda to say that she was a spy. She's still being held in jail. Her husband's now like on hunger strike outside of the the Iranian embassy. Um, So words do matter, gaps do matter. And if he's going to be the leader, even if it's for a short period before either his party calls a vote of no confidence or and then parliament is dissolved and then there's an election and maybe he's out of power who, who I don't I don't know the particulars I don't have a crystal ball um, and there are so many different variables to kind of to game out here that it's almost it's not impossible um, but if he takes over yes he, today he's also <coughs> been um, criticized by the former head of the civil service who worked with him when he was the mayor of London um, and points to his kind of lack of lack of strategy, lack of clarity, and his his proposal for what to do about the Irish the Irish backstop or any of those kind of um, border problems is, well, we'll deal with that when we're out. Mm-hmm. Um, he talks himself in circles often. Um, he said that tr- the, the deal that May negotiated is dead. The EU says that's the only deal in town. So he's, he's and, the, and the, the chief diplomat who I was referring to before, sorry, the, the former head of the civil service who I was re- referring, referring to before, um, kind of pointed out the man has, has basically put himself in a straitjacket and painted himself into a corner. And there's only so many weeks left in the parliamentary timetable before the summer recess. Um, and then again, when they are back in session, that that you can actually devote to dealing with the border and renegotiating a trade deal. And he keeps kind of his advisors are obviously kind of slipping him these different references to obscure trade logs like GATT 24, which is like I can't remember the exact acronym, but it's an article of like a general trade agreement. And the problem is Boris that you can't just like pick and choose which rule is going to help you when. It's basically a rule saying, oh, tariffs will stay in place for 10 years. But the thing is, it's part of a larger yeah. trade agreement <laughs> with the EU. You can't just, it's not a, it's not an all you can eat buffet. Um, and yeah, so he's painted himself into a corner. He says it's eminently feasible. That's what he was saying in the debate when he decided to show up. Finally, um, he didn't show up for the first debate. Uh, and he, he said it's eminently feasible and just time wise, I don't know if he thinks that time is an illusion, but time wise, there's literally, it's almost impossible to see how that's going to happen. Um, people are pointing to the fact that because it's Boris, he'll then be like, well, you know, we're going to ask for an extension because we're so close. I would say that there's a strong likelihood of that happening, but then who knows what could happen because he'll be presiding over a very fractured Tory party that is really cannibalizing itself. Um, there's, I think it was a column in The Economist last week that was kind of asking, it's not so much who's going to be the leader of the Tory party, but whether or not the Tory party is going to survive um, as an entity. Um, they got a drubbing in the EU elections um, in, in May, so the ones that they were, no one was supposed to be taking part in. And really, strangely, the Lib Dems had a resurgence as well, because they have a clear line on Brexit. Mm-hmm. And the, the two main parties are, are tearing themselves apart, actually over this um, for a third year running. So we don't have much time, but one more question. Um, from the point of view of people in the US, if it is Boris Johnson, what does that mean for uh, relations between the US and the UK? Donald Trump and <laughs> Boris Johnson, do they tend to get along? I mean, they will. Boris is, um, that's his style, is to pretend it's all fine, and it's all lovely, <laughs> it's all jolly. Um, he's not in the contingency of people that get offended by Trump. Why would he be? Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sink to the level of talking about hair right now, because honestly, I think (laughs) Boris Johnson's hair is probably the most charming thing about him. Um, but of course he will, of course, of course he's going to, he, he's a, he's a man kind of in a similar mold to Trump in that Mm -hmm. he, his, his kind of, his big kind of not he, he was always in politics, but he really came out. You know, he, his rise began when he was the mayor of London, which is a job that's a lot of show mm-hmm. and a lot of showing off with very little kind of substance behind it. And that's what that's what his entire kind of mayoral yeah. um, stint was about: was these big ribbon cutting affairs, bluster, jolly glad handing, and that sort of thing. And and you know, his record be, can be debated. I mean, it, it, he didn't really have that much power um, when he's then in power. Um, it's gaff after gaff after gaff, and he's also a journalist. So a lot of the things that are pointed to as as um, his misguided views on policy, history, British positions on things, for example, staying in in the war in Yemen and supporting arms sales to to the Saudis who are conducting a war in Yemen. Um, he 
yeah, he he is he's not going to clash with Trump. Let's just put it that way. I can't, I'm finding it hard to think about how he's going to clash with Trump. Okay. I mean, he's but neither. I mean, Jeremy Hunt is Jeremy Hunt is a he would be agreeable with Trump, but in a slightly more underhanded way. I mean, the man mm-hmm. has written books about privatizing the, the NHS. So that's got to be popular. Uh, um, okay, yeah. well, unfortunately, well, we're, we're out yeah. of time, but we do appreciate you breaking it down. It certainly looks like it's going to go the way that you're you're laying out. Um, we'll be watching, of course, if it does go in that way. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people here in the US, um, we feel for you in the UK, like we've been <laughs> dealing with this too. So uh, Shavala Madlina, thank you as always for joining us. Thank you for watching this clip from The Damage Report. For more content from the show and access to TYT Network members only exclusives, go to tyt.com slash Brooke. Wait, no, it's tyt.com slash John. Go to tyt.com slash John to sign up.